Good evening. Welcome back tonight. So good to see so many of you back tonight. Thank you for that presentation. The, the thought of discipleship, what an incredible thing. Uh, and I agree, this is one of the things that we've been lacking in our churches. And uh, we, we've, uh, our, our conference, the conference that I'm involved in, and uh, this conference right here, the Berchtaler, uh, together we've been with the Bolivian ministry all these years, and they started the Sea on Discipleship course over there. And one of the things that I remember talking to Abe Harder, uh, you'll know Abe Harder as uh, one of the Bolivian missionaries, um, and Via Nueva, no, Via Nueva, I'm thinking Durango now, uh, Via Nueva, and he said that when the Spanish ministries, when they go through the Matthew books and the Seon material, by the time they reach book six, when they finish book six, they're not encouraged to be in service. They're expected to be in service. They're expected to pass it on to other people. It's not something that they do to just hope that they're going to produce disciples. It's an expectation. You enter this so that you will make more disciples. And it's a tremendous, uh, a tremendous uh, uh, way of furthering the gospel. And I would love to talk to you, David, later on. I don't know how much time we'll have, if we'll have time to interact, but maybe I can get your contact information and communicate further. Well, it's been a very good week, weekend. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, Tina and I want to just say thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Thank you for the hospitality and for letting us into your hearts and into your homes. It's, it's a privilege that we uh, cherish. It's not something that we take lightly. We recognize that you could have had anyone. And uh, maybe most of you didn't have a choice, but I mean, uh, you still came, right? <laughs> uh, but you had a choice. Those of you who had, had us in your home, you had a choice and you had us in. And it's been a great, great experience for us. So we thank you for that. Your hearts have been very open to us and uh, your homes. And uh, we felt very welcome, very much a part of your lives. So thank you for that. May the Lord bless you for that. Over the last two nights, we've talked about uh, missions. We talked uh, on Friday night about Hosea, how Hosea was actually called to live out the message of God, not just preach the message. The, the prophets had already preached for 400 years, and the people weren't getting it. They needed to see it. And Hosea was asked to now marry someone who was going to be unfaithful, just as Israel had been unfaithful to God. And he was supposed to live out this, this faithful marriage to someone who was running around and so that the people could see what God's love, God's grace, God's forgiveness looks like. We looked last night uh, at the fact that every one of us is actually called, but it, we often don't listen when we're called. So the question and the challenge last night was, is the voice of God enough? Do we need more? Or is, it, is the voice of God just for a few? And we saw that it is actually for all of us. And I want to remind us again of the theme verse that we have for this weekend. It's uh, uh, First Peter, First Peter chapter 4. As each of us has received the gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Not, our, not just the great opportunities that we have in life, not just the wealth that we accumulate, but the manifold grace of God. And as we've been reminded, it's by grace you've been saved through faith. That not, that's not of your worth, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. So minister as the manifold grace of God. If it's speaking, then speak. If it's ministering, if it's serving, if it's sweeping the floor, whatever it is. But in all things, that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong glory and dominion forever and ever. That's the challenge so tonight, uh, I realize that as we've looked at this, there's been kind of a focus on the people that we send, that uh, we actually, we all have a calling, but some people have actually gone, and we look at these people, and we've sent these people, and we say, way to go. So often we pat ourselves on the back and say, we have this amount of missionaries out in the field, and I know for myself, uh, I love it when, uh, when we were in Belize and we had from our, our small congregation who was actually a mission church who was so dependent on outside help, but when we could send people from our church into the city and help with children's camps, we loved it. And it's, it's a thing of pride. It's a healthy pride where we say we're, we're contributing back. And so we love that when we can do that. But the people who often feel left out are the ones who stay at home who never go out, who don't see what's happening. The people that fill the benches every Sunday or every time there's a mission conference, we sit in the benches and we wonder, where do I fit in the picture? 
Tonight I want to speak to you. Because you have a purpose. When, when, Paul, when Peter said, as each of us has received a gift, that involved you. So tonight I want to speak to you. So let's pray, and then we'll get started. Father, thank you this evening for everyone here. Thank you for the testimonies, the sharing that we've already had. Thank you for the reminder that we are to make disciples. That's what missions is, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not in our own strength, but remembering that you are always with us, yes, even till the end of this age. So, Father, tonight as we go into the message, I pray, Father, that you would minister to our hearts and you would recognize that every one of us has purpose. Every one of us has a calling. And, Lord, may we acknowledge that, may we surrender to that, and may you be glorified by it. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that I realized upon coming to Lacrete is this is actually a sports community. I talked to Jason and Tina, or what Tina and I did, and we found out that hockey is the thing. Uh, any hockey fans out here? Quite a number of hockey fans. I, I think that's great. I don't know enough about hockey to be a fan, so sorry to offend you, but I do like sports. I remember when I was into sports, we lived in the United States, and we didn't have hockey. I mean, it was way too hot to think of hockey, so we had football. And how many of you know football, like NFL? Do, do, we, do any of you like NFL? Oh, man, don't throw anything at me, okay? Because <laughs> I'm going to use an NFL analogy. Because I, I don't know anything about hockey. I can't use any sports uh, hockey analogy. So I wanted to use a sports analogy because this is a sports community. So I want to use a, a, a football analogy. And this is a very common scene on every NFL game. Do any of you know what this is? It's not just a bunch of guys showing their butts, okay? <laughs> Although they are, but that's not the purpose of this picture. Uh, the purpose of this picture is to demonstrate that they have a, an offensive huddle. Now, in this offensive huddle, the quarterback tells his offensive team what the play is. So they have names for their, for their plays. Well, I don't know what these names are, but if they would, whatever name they give it, if they would say, this is the play that we're going to do, then everybody knows where their place is. This, this receiver knows, okay, I need to be here, and in X amount of seconds, I need to be there, and I need to turn around and be ready. But he also knows that he's the number one receiver, and if he, the de defense is covering him or blocking him too much, then the secondary receiver knows that he's supposed to be over there in X amount of time, and he's supposed to turn around and be ready in case the number one is covered and so on. And they have all of this. They don't need a lot of time. Uh, they, they just discuss it very quickly, and they know what they're supposed to do, and if they do it well, then they get points, right? That's kind of the idea. And I would say that this is kind of what we do in churches. We have our mission boards, we have our administrative boards, and we have all these strategizing moments. We, we brainstorm and we look at what do we want to do? How are we going to get it accomplished? And we have all these plans, and we, we, we get excited, and it's so good. And it's great. But uh, can you imagine... Uh, now, just for a moment, uh, churches do this, but this is now an NFL team. This is where it all happens. Can you imagine now, just for a moment, if this team would decide not to break huddle? Can you imagine what would happen? They have this great plan. They have this great strategy, and they choose not to break huddle. Then you're imagining what happens to a church who has all this brainstorming, all this talk about all this mission, all this and all that, and never execute. This is what I imagine happening when they don't break huddle. The people on the sideline are just bewildered. What's going on? Someone has said that this is what a church looks like without missions. The people on the sideline, the people in the benches, they're like, what's our purpose? Why are we here? Tonight, I also want to suggest that this is a mission team without a church. This is what missionaries do when they don't have a church supporting them. So I want to talk tonight about what is it that the church does. What is it, what's the responsibility of those of us that are left behind, that those, those of us that stay at home? And in, in, in preparation for this, if you have your Bibles open, I invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. 
In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul starts uh, teaching about the, the, the struggle in marriage. He talks about the husbands loving, the wives submitting, and all this, and how it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ, how it relates to God's relationship with us. He talks in verse, uh, chapter 6, he talks about children and parents honoring your, your, your father and mother, not provoking your children to wrath, and so on. In chapter 6, verse 5, he goes on to the, the relationship between employees and employers, servants and masters, and so forth. And then finally we get to verse 10, and then he says, now we want to talk about the real battle in life. So Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10, he says, finally, my brethren. In other words, I've told you all this stuff. I've told you all, all this great stuff about these different relationships, but now we need to get to the heart of it. We need to get to the heart of where the battle really lies. So he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, it's interesting that he would say this because he's just described all these human relationships. And he says, now in context of all these human relationships, he says, oh, finally, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and, and in the power of his might. And put on the whole armor of God. In other words, now in, in, relation to all, in context of all these relationships, I want you to be ready for battle. There's something significant happening. He says, I want you to be, have the armor of God so that you're able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And you wonder, why in the world would he say that? I thought he's talking about husband and wife, and I thought he was talking about parents and children, and he's talking about boss and worker. What are you talking about? What is it that you mean about the wiles of the devil? He goes on in verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against, prince, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. In other words, the battle is far greater than our eyes can see. There is a battle happening in the spiritual realm that is influencing all of society. It's influencing our decisions. It's influencing our media. It's influencing the way we interact with one another. So the fights that we have among people, they're the result of the battle that's happening in the heavenly realms. So he said, I want you to be on guard. I want you to stand firm in the Lord. Don't stand firm in your own capacity. Don't stand firm in your own understanding of who your neighbor is. I want you to stand firm in the Lord. Get the grounding right. I want you to be able to wear the full armor of God so that you can actually have the chance in this battle. Because the battle that we face is not against husband and wife. It's not parents and children. It's not employee and employer. But the battle is in the heavenly places. It's against principalities, against powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual hosts of wickedness. Therefore, because the battle is not here, the battle is in the heavenly realms, in the spiritual realms, because of that, he says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your, tr your waist with truth. In other words, be people of integrity. Don't be people who, who say one thing and live another. Don't preach one thing and live a life deceptive and different from what you're preaching. Be people of integrity. Know the truth. Live the truth. So put on the belt of truth, having, uh, I'm sorry, uh, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Guard your faith, guard your heart. Don't let unrighteousness, don't let evil control you. Guard yourself. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In other words, always be ready to share the gospel, the love of Jesus Christ. Share the word of God. Be ready, in season and out of season, Peter says. Above all, take on the, taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Don't depend on yourself. Faith in Christ. Don't be swayed by the pressures of life. Trust the one who has redeemed you. Verse 17, And take up the helmet of salvation, Guard your thoughts and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So that's the, that's the armor that we have to fight with. Those are our tools. 
And he uses this as to, to make a very strong point. The battle is not physical. The battle is spiritual. And every one of us is involved in battle. Paul made this illustration because he wanted us to understand that when we engage in any type of ministry, we're fighting a battle that humans don't fight in human strength. And I know that this is a weekend missions conference, and we focus this on missionaries, on people that we send out. But may I say to you that your pastors, your youth leaders, your mission board, your people who are orchestrating things, they're part of this team. They're part of this, the, the ones that you send. They're, they're the ones fighting. In many cases, they are the ones that you would see fighting the spiritual battle. It's not just the ones that you send out, but it's also the ones sta staying at home. Now, Paul has just told us here, he says that this is what we have to do. This is what we need to prepare for. This is the equipment that we have to use. It's not a literal machete, but actually the sword of the Spirit. Thanks for leaving it up here. It was good. Uh, but it, the literal word of God is the sword of the Spirit. And then he moves into something that I find very significant. Verse 19, he says, uh, first in verse 18, he says, or 17, he says, the, um, Take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And then he immediately transitions into our responsibility. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end uh, with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. So in other words, I want you to be people of prayer. This is a shift now, not for the people who are on the front lines, but this is a shift for the people that are staying in the benches. He says, I need you to be people of prayer. I need you to be interceding for the people who are on the front lines with all prayer and supplication. Don't just say, Lord, would you bless them? Would you protect them? But find out what are their needs and pray specifically. He invites us to be people of prayer. He goes on in verse 19, and this is where it catches me every time. The New King James says, And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, and that, it may, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. The NIV says in verse 19, he says, pray also for me. The reason this floors me every time is because Paul is not just a guy that, that all of a sudden walks up off the street or comes out of the back alley and says, man, I'd like to put my faith in Jesus Christ. Will you pray for me? That's not who Paul was. Paul is a guy who, when he was preaching, you know, he's a long, you think, you think the report is long? No, I preach long. This guy is long-winded. I mean, he preached so long that the guy in the third story fell asleep and fell down, and he was dead. And Paul went over there, and he prayed for him. He came to life. This is Paul. This is the guy whom God entrusted with writing over half of the New Testament. He's not just some high school dropout. This is Paul. He is the guy that we look to as the model preacher. He's the model missionary. He's the one who gets stoned and he gets he drug out of town and left there for dead and people come and pray for him. He goes back and preaches to the guys that stoned him. This is Paul. This is the guy that was shipwrecked and he, he prays for the people and he helps the people on the ship and pr protects their life while the ship is being wrecked. This is the guy. This is the guy that we would say he is a spiritual giant. He, hasn't, he doesn't have need for people to pray for him. Man, he's got this in the bag. He's better than any offensive lineman. He's better than any NFL. He's better than hockey. He's a man. And this is the guy, he says, pray also for me? Why? Why do we need to pray for people like Paul? He says we need to pray for him because he understands the battle is real. He, we need to pray for him because the battle is super significant. The battle is more than flesh and blood. The battle is against spiritual hosts of wickedness. The battle is real. Paul, the man who is idolized by so many. Paul, the man who wouldn't back down for anyone. Paul, the guy who looked at the uh, high priest and called him a whitewashed tomb. This is the guy. He says, pray also for me that I may... Uh, boldness to speak as I ought to speak. 
he shuddered. His knees would knock because he was afraid. He wasn't afraid of his life. They had already tried to kill him. He just walked back in. He wasn't afraid of going to jail because he wrote it from jail. He wasn't afraid of being hurt and shipwrecked because he said that he'd been shipwrecked several times. He wasn't afraid to get beat. He'd been beaten several times. He said 40 lashes minus one. 40 would have killed him. 39 is what he got. This is a guy who is not afraid of people. But he understood that he had the word of life in his hands. He had the mystery of the gospel entrusted to him. And he was engaged in a battle in the principalities of darkness. And he was afraid. He said, pray for me that I may have boldness, that I would speak as I ought to speak, not as I desire to speak. Because sometimes we want to say things that we ought, ought to not do. A friend of mine said, never miss a good opportunity to shut up. Paul said, pray that I would have boldness to speak as I ought to speak. Why? Because he understood the battle. I did some reading on what it looks like to be in battle. And uh, I realized that as Mennonites, we don't advocate war. So I, but I want to give a war analogy. And so please understand me. I'm not rooting for war. I'm not condoning war. I'm not advocating for war. But we have a lot to learn from these guys. This is a, a graph of what happened in the Iraq war. This was put together in 2005, and David Saad is the one who put this together and wrote this. But he said during the Iraq war, he, he talked to the people, he did the research, and he found out how many people were on the ground. He figured out how many people were working behind the scenes, how many were doing logistics, uh, meaning that they not only provided food, but they did medical support, they did their clothing, washing clothes, they did bridge building, and they did providing, providing fuel, ma fuel, vehicle maintenance, tank maintenance, bringing artillery and all that stuff. There's all kinds of logistical maneuvers that have to take place. He, and so as he calculated all of this stuff, he realized that in war, in the Iraq war, only 40% of the battle was fought on the front lines. Think of that. Only 40% of the battle was fought by the men on the front lines. 36% of the battle was fought by logistics. In other words, the people, they were providing fuel, they were bringing food, they were bringing clothes, they were washing clothes, they were bringing medical staff, they were bringing uh, uh, vehicle maintenance, they were building bridges to where they could get to where they needed to go. Without this 36%, the 40% on the front lines would not have had what they needed to fight the battle. 24% of the people involved in the Iraq war were doing administrative work. They were making sure that everybody had all the stuff that they need. They could buy all the supplies. They could make sure everything was ordered and delivered and so on, all that stuff. There's a lot of behind the scenes that happens. So in other words, what I want us to understand is for every hour of, uh, of work on the front line, there was an hour and a half of behind the scenes. This is warfare. This is battle. This is what it looks like to be in war. Now, Paul understood this as well, and he said that we are not engaged against flesh and blood, but against spiritual hosts of wickedness, and he puts this in a wartime perspective. He said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. In other words, he said, understand ministry, understand missions as war, because we have an enemy, and we are in war. So may I suggest to you tonight that when we think of sending missionaries out, when we think of sending people into the ministry, we do ourselves great harm by selecting people and say, boy, you are so gifted. You're, you know, you are the right guy, the right gal for the job. We're just going to select you and we're going to send you on your way and we are going to pat ourselves on the back because you're doing such a great job at home. I know you'll do a great job abroad. We have men and women out there who are fighting battles they don't, they don't know how to handle. When Tina and I were with our kids, we went to Belize. We got there in, in our second year. Then all of a sudden, a guy shows up, and he, he starts coming to our church. And he is, he's about 20 years older than me. 
And he was a mess. Let me tell you, he was a mess. He, he lived an immoral life before coming to Christ. He was not a good guy. He was a rough guy. He was not very kind to his family. But he accepted Christ. He accepted the forgiveness of Christ. But he would have done well to model what this forgiveness looked like and actually go to his family and deal with some of the issues and ask for forgiveness for how he had treated them. He didn't. Rather than doing that, he decided that he would impose his faith on his family. And he started pressuring his wife, he started pressuring his sons, and, and I don't know if they had daughters. I think they did, but I know he pressured his sons. And he pressured them to accept this Jesus whom he had now accepted. But his life had not changed that much outside. Yes, he wasn't immoral anymore, but he was still mean. He was still angry in many ways. And he didn't treat him very kindly. And the family turned against him. I can understand that. We do that all the time because the battle is in the heavenly places, but it gets played out here on earth. And so his family turned against him, and they got actually vicious with him. They had real machetes. They did. They had the long machetes. And his sons, they came towards him with the machete. They were going to cut him to pieces. They were going to kill him. Literally. They were angry. They were upset at him. And he would come to my office two or three times a week. And he came there one day and he said, Man, my sons, they want to kill me. My wife wants me dead. And he didn't know how to handle this. And I didn't know how to handle this. I was a schnodonese. I was a young pastor. I had no idea how to do this. I didn't know what to do. He, I, I, I tried to encourage him. We prayed together, sent him on, and, and uh, oh man, his family did all kinds of wicked things. They had him thrown in jail. They lied about him, had him thrown in jail, but he bought himself out of jail, and he came home, took the bus, and snuck home, and found out as he, he got to his house, he saw that there's vehicles there, so he kind of snuck into the house and listened from the inside what they were talking about him on the veranda, and he had cops he had community leaders, and they were discussing how they were going to falsify documents and they were going to rebrand all his cattle while he was in jail and steal it all from him to where he would be left homeless. Literally, it's his wife, his son, and a police officer and a community leader. This is what's happening. And then he's upset and he comes back to me and he says, man, what do I do? They're going to do this. They're going to take away my cattle. They're going to, oh, wow, 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 wow. Right? All kind of, and I have no idea how to handle this. And I'm struggling. He comes back in the next week, and I don't know what happened, some kind of fiasco, and he comes back and he said, man, maybe my family's right, maybe they'd be better off without me, I just want to kill myself. I just want you to know I'm going to take my life. It's like, dude, you're afraid they're going to kill you, now you want to kill yourself? What's up? And I was at my wit's end. I had absolutely no idea what to do. I didn't know how to handle this. See, we were in a battle in a spiritual battle. And I said to this man, I said, you know what? I have absolutely no idea how to help you. But will you do me one favor? I said, would you give me permission to where I can call and tell your story to people whom I trust and get advice? He said, you can tell anybody you want. I just need help. So I called pastors whom I trusted, called four men. And I said, what do we do with this? How, how do you advise me? And they said, well, you can't really advise from sitting 2,000, 3,000 miles away. You need to be a little bit more entrenched. So they, they had really no advice for me. But here's what they said. The, the one thing that we can do, and all four of them did, I will commit to pray for you. And they did. And I don't know how it happens. I don't know how God does it. But somehow... In the midst of all this, God gave me wisdom. He gave me understanding. And I walked this journey with this man. And over a period of several months, there was a, enough reconciliation brought into this family to where they could live together, they could coexist at least, and they had their stuff together again. This is a battle. And this is what Paul understood. And this is why he says, pray for me also. Don't think that just because I have a title that I don't need prayer. Just because you send them out, don't think that you're off the hook. Just because you have a pastor, don't think that you don't, you don't, you're not needed. Your pastor, your missionaries, your boards, they're in a spiritual battle. For every hour that they, your pastor spends counseling, you should have an hour and a half of support in the background. You need people who have his back. This is what Paul was really asking for. He wanted somebody to have his back while he's on the front lines. When we send people out, 
We need to have their back. We, uh, soon after that whole fiasco, we found out that there was actually a group of people in Winkler, Manitoba, who got together every other week to pray for Low German Ministry. We were involved in Low German Ministry. And they connected with me and they said, Henry, tell us some things that are happening in your life. We want to pray for you. And we kept in regular contact. They had our backs. A couple of years after that, we were involved in another fiasco there. And a gentleman from our community, um, not a very nice guy. I, let me just say, he was downright wicked. He was not a good guy. He was a nasty fellow. And he was part of the church in the community. He was. But he decided that he wanted to commit a very bad act. And so he, he premeditated how he was going to do this. And while there was a funeral happening across the street from his house, and he and his wife had invited his niece, 13-year-old niece, to come and babysit his children, he left the funeral home, he left the funeral early to come and rape his niece. Literally. He was guilt-stricken. As soon as he had done it, he came to our uh, our church, and, and we're, we're not part of that, same, he's part of a different church, but our, our associate pastor at the time was this guy's uh, nephew, of all, no, cousin, his nephew. Uh, and so he came to me, man, I've done something bad. And this pastor, he said, well, what do we do? Now I know what happened. What do we do? And I, he came to me and he said, Henry, he said, we're in trouble. We got to do something. We can't just let this go. And I said, you're right. He has to go report himself. And he said, well, he's not going to do that. I said, well, you need, you need to let him know with, under no uncertain terms, either he will or I will. And so he decided that he would, this, this man, he decided, well, he would go tell their bishop. I said, that's not good enough. You got to go deeper than that. And so then it, it created a lot of family feud because now we became the bad guys. We did. And so this uh, man, he... Um, he went and told his brother what had happened, and to get, the brother said, you've got to go tell the bishop. And they went and told the bishop, and now everything was taken care of. And I said, no, it's not. So I told our, our associate pastor, I said, uh, we have to go talk to the bishop. And now it, it, it has happened on, on a Sunday, and now on a, on a Monday. No, it happened on a, on a Monday, and now it was Tuesday. And, and we went to the bishop, and I said, so what are you going to do about this? He said, well, our... Our elders, they've uh, talked about it, and, and they don't really have time to do anything with it right now, but they're going to get together Thursday, and they're going to discuss the next point. I said, that's not good enough. I said, has this woman, uh, this girl, has she been tested? Has she been checked out medically? No, no, we haven't done any of that. I said, do you know if this man has been with any other women? Well, yeah, he has been. I said, do you know if he has any diseases that he's carrying around? No, we haven't thought about that. I said, I said you have to get this girl to the hospital. You have to get her checked. And this man has to be reported to the authority. I said, this is a sin, but it's also a crime. And it has to be dealt with on both levels. And either you're going to do it, or I will. And he said, well, we'll do it, uh, but we'll talk to our elders. And they'll get to it Thursday or Friday. I said, it's going, to be ha it's going to happen tonight, or tomorrow I'm going to the authorities. It will happen. And then he said, well, if you will allow us to handle it, then I will see to it that it gets done tonight. And a long story short... He did get reported. He did go to jail. But less than a month later, he was out on parole, and he still lived half a mile from our house. And I would see him over and over again. And he refused to look at me. It took an entire year. An entire year, literally. Finally, this man was broken, and he came back to me, and he said he, he needed help. He said, the, the community has treated me very, very wrongly. And I know you will speak the truth. And he came for help. But all this time, we had people who had our backs. We had people who were standing in the gap. They had our backs. When Paul said, pray for me also, he's not talking about pray that God will bless me with all the abundance that I need. Pray for me that I will have a good travel. That's not what he's talking about. He had enough shipwreck. He knew what that was all about. He prayed because he was in a battle. I can promise you, if you wholeheartedly follow Jesus Christ, you will experience the battle. And you need somebody that has your back. That was Paul's cry. 
So when I look at you this evening, and I see so many of you, you will never go on a mission trip. Why not? Well, because you don't feel like that's where God wants you. But maybe you're wondering, what can I do? Well, I can tell you what you can do. You can make sure that you have the backs of your missionaries, that you have the backs of your, your pastors. Don't just say, that well, we're going to pray for you. That's good. Call them. Talk to them. Write them emails. What's going on in your life? What are the struggles in your life? What are the battles you're fighting? How can I specifically get a call and something new that somebody was thinking about them and what it would do to their morale? To know somebody has their back? You can be that people. You can be those people who have their backs. Paul said, pray for me also that I may have boldness to speak the things that I ought to speak. That is the heart's cry of every missionary. That is the heart's cry of every pastor, of every youth leader, that we would do things well, that we would do things with integrity, that we would do things that produce results, that would produce, thing, produce more people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to how Paul describes this to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. He says, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored, just as it was with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not everyone has faith. You see, his battle, he understood the battle to be a spiritual battle, but he said, man, I see it on a daily life because people they encounter, I encounter, they are wicked. I encounter evil people and I face them face to face. Uh, and this is where, although the battle is there, it gets played out right here and it's tough. I need to be able to do this well. Don't suppose that because I, I can withstand shipwreck. Don't suppose because I know how to do, uh, do, do life in famine or in poverty. Don't suppose that just because I get flogged and I come out or I get stoned and I go back and preach. Don't, don't suppose that I'm a lone ranger. I need you. That was Paul's cry. I suspect that if you had a heart-to-heart -heart with your pastor, I suspect that if you had a heart-to-heart -heart with each of your missionaries, they would say, I need you. I need you. So if you're wondering tonight, what is my role in the life of missions in this church? What is, the life, what is my role in the life of missions in this conference? Because I will never be sent. I want to say this. You can encourage, you can call them, and you can certainly pray for them. For every hour of ministry that happens out there, you need an hour and a half of backup. It's real. You can have their backs. So if I could wrap it up this way. Peter said, as each of you has received a gift, minister it to one another. Not the way that it feels good, but as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, speak. If anyone ministers, and this could mean a lot of things. This could mean pray. This could be calling. This could be writing. This could be going to visit. This could be to just encourage. But if anyone ministers, do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's my heart for this church. To be people who are used by God. To use your gifts ministering to one another, whether you're at home or abroad. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this Berktaller Church. Thank you for this conference. Thank you for the missionaries that they've sent Thank you for the people who have planned it and, and who stand behind them. Thank you for those who stay at home and they kind of keep the things going. They give money so the missionaries can be paid. 
Thank you for those who are questioning and wondering, where do I fit in? Father, my prayer is that every one of them, every one of us here tonight, will recognize that we have purpose. Because you have not redeemed us for the sake of dangling us out in the open air uh, so that we can figure stuff out. You have given us purpose. You've given us a calling that is, that is far beyond anything we can imagine, but we've, we try to figure it out, Lord. And you've actually called us to live by faith. Just go do it. So tonight, I pray for those who have been wondering that you would give them clarity. Maybe they need to be people who pray. Maybe they need to be people who encourage. Maybe they need to be people who challenge. Maybe they need to be people who get up and go. But whatever it is, Father, may you clarify in their hearts and minds, may you give them a burning desire to be all that you have called them to be. And may together, all of us, may we glorify you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that challenge. Can you imagine what would happen in our community if we applied what we learned uh, over the weekend? It would be an amazing revival. I'll call on the song leaders to come up. And um, during that time, I'll, I'll talk about the offering boxes in the back. There's three offering boxes in the back at the end of the aisle. Uh, all the proceeds that come in go to the missions being represented here and uh, the expenses for the mission, for the travel and, and for holding the conference. So thank you very much if you already have offered and we just encourage that uh, if you see it there when you leave to drop something in there. If you're able, can we rise? If you're willing and able. I have found a phrase of errors of 10,000 to my soul. strong 